keys are to the glory days at the stick. From who's got it better than us to brick by brick. It's always the 49ers way from off season to game day. Yeah, we talk back. It's the 49ers cut back. It's 49ers Cutback Podcast time, and we have lots of 49ers news to talk about. The offseason is going, and there could be some changes with the 49ers. Of course, could Robert Sala be on the move? Um, for selfish reasons, I hope not. But I, for the great job he's done with this defense, I think it'd be pretty crazy if no one offered him the head coaching job. He's heck of a coach. He's... Got that team, that defense playing great two years in a row. This year, even more impressive with the guys they were missing most of the year. Um, Robert Sala should have probably been a head coach after last year. But And the thing I think that's most impressive to me is he's been able to move away from that cover three scheme when he has to and run other defenses. So he's not a one-trick pony. Um, so I... I mean, hats off to the guy. Good luck to him. Never, never gonna hate on him if he does leave. But for selfish reasons, I hope he doesn't get one of those jobs. Yeah, I'm still surprised that he was back this year as the 49ers D coordinator. I was fully expecting him to be gone after the season he put together. Two, I guess I, I, at this point it's two seasons ago. But uh, in reality, the things he did this year were probably far more impressive than anything that we put together as a team last year. He has done an absolutely incredible job of getting this team playing at a high level and, as Horse said especially, adjusting and adapting. Yeah, so he's he's been interviewing already this week, and he's interviewing with the Lions, Jags, Falcons, and now added to the list the Chargers. Um, all are looking for you know new head coach, and he would be a you know great choice for any of them to choose. Um, he knows how to be, he's real black and white. He tells the players exactly what he means. He's very direct. They know what's going on. Those are the kind of guys that can build a positive culture. And somebody that's, want, a team that's wanting to change the culture wants to bring in a guy like Robert Sala because he can do it. Um, he can bring in guys that he's familiar with and they can change the culture together. I think it would be a great hire. I'm not sure these jobs are ultimately going to choose him just because of the matchups. You know, I think, you know, maybe the Chargers are possibly going to move for a more of an offensive, you know, name. And so you got things that it might not work out. But if it does, Robert Sala could be taking a coach with him to be an offensive coordinator. And the name that's been most, you know, kind of drawn to him and attached to him is uh, passing game coordinator Mike LaFleur. Of course, what would it mean if we lost Mike LaFleur if he went with Robert Sala? Um, it wouldn't be great. I mean, you never want to lose anyone important off a of coaching staff that is coaching well together. Um, I honestly might rather lose him than running game coordinator Mike McDaniel, though, because the Niners' run game has been extremely impressive the last couple of years. The pass game has not been the best part of their team, <laughs> to put it lightly. That, that's putting it nicely. Now, this year... Look who was playing quarterback most of the year. But, um, like I said, I don't, I don't want to see either of them go, but it's very likely he's going to take one of them if he, right. if he gets a head coaching job, which I, hopefully he doesn't get. I, I want him to get a coaching job, but I, no. I, I think, I think honestly, which coach he takes probably depends on which team would have, would he would sign with. Uh, if he ended up in a place like Detroit with the Lions, I could see him taking a run game coordinator and trying to build it around DeAndre Swift, trying to build the offense around running the football, pounding it downhill. If he gets a job with like the Chargers or something like that, then yeah, probably a more passing-minded coach, LaFleur, would be a better fit with Mr. Herbert down there in, in Los Angeles. I almost said San Diego. That's, they're not there anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's, a like you said, there's a really good chance one of them's going. And even if one of them doesn't go with... With Sala, there's a good chance that whoever one of the new coaches ends up being in one of those locations is going to be fishing around for somebody like one of these two coaches, right. whether they want to establish more of a run-style offense, run first, or if they have a young 
gunslinger out there who can sling the ball downfield, um, then they might go with him at the little floor. So either uh, either guy, either guy could leave. There's a g also a good chance that both could end up leaving this offseason, which would be a really man. That would be is that, which which is a worse blow? All the injuries this season or losing three key pieces of your coaching staff? I, I think it hurts to lose. You know the the big pieces. You know, last year McDaniel, uh, actually Arizona wanted him to be their offensive coordinator, mm -hmm. and it was blocked by Shanahan because he was allowed to. Now this year you can't block, so you know he could go down there and I mean really he would be the offensive coordinator for Cliff Kingsbury who calls the plays, so it's not really that great of a situation. But if he wanted to, he could, ultimately he could leave. Would it be a blow? Yes, I think the defensive coordinator could possibly be a bigger blow because you still have Kyle Shanahan on the offensive side. And Kyle Shanahan can, you know, develop more coaches, probably already has developed more coaches, and he could just take on more of the offense. I don't think that'll be such a big thing. But who would take over the defensive coordinator positions? I mean, there's a few names that have kind of been coming out already, Horse. Dan Quinn, of course, Gus Bradley, because they run the same system. And with the new coach in Los Angeles, with the Chargers, there'll be a new coach. Also, some names I've seen thrown out there, or of course, Somebody that's already on the staff, D'Amico Ryan's a linebacker coach. He's an up-and-comer. Kyle Shanahan said he's definitely going to be a coordinator, possibly even a head coach sooner or later. And we also have old names like Wade Phillips that are being thrown around oh. and even heard of Raheem Morris because he's had some time spent with Kyle Shanahan, and he's applying for head coaching jobs. But if he doesn't get it, I'm sure he's going to want to be looking to get to the right situation. Of course, do any of those guys – kind of pique your interest, and which one do you think is the leader in the clubhouse? Well, I would say there's three guys with a high likelihood of them keeping, and number one has got to be D'Amico Ryan. Uno! Of them moving him up. Because couldn't he go as Sala and be a D coordinator? And I, that's a good reason to move him up, mm -hmm. if you want to keep a young coach you really like on your staff. Now, that would just depend if Kyle thinks he's ready to run an entire defense. Um... Dan Quinn, I would say, was probably the second most likely because Kyle coached with him in Atlanta. It would be a reversal of roles. Quinn was the head coach and Kyle was the old coordinator. But that culmination did get to a Super Bowl in Atlanta. and Well, 2-1 two, two at least. To a Super Bowl in Atlanta. Um, and then third, I would say, would be Gus Bradley because he, the Niners are built to run that cover three system that... Seattle runs, and Gus Bradley was the creator of the Legion of Boom defense in Seattle. So I think those are three good names. I wouldn't expect to see Raheem Morris. Um, I think he's a good coach. I just put him behind those guys in likelihood. Um, there's always the chance that there's someone else they really like that we don't know about. Maybe it's a position coach somewhere else. There's always that chance, but I would say those three are the highest likelihood to see coordinating the 49ers defense if Saul leaves with the highest likelihood being D'Amico Ryans. Yeah, I agree with you there. I think D'Amico Ryans is the leader in the clubhouse right now, and that's just because he has the inside track. He's been there. The body of work is apparent. Kyle Shanahan has seen it. He knows it. And if Kyle Shanahan truly does believe that he's going to be a head coach one day, you want to hold on to him as long as you possibly can. Um, you know, Kyle Shanahan's growing his his coaching tree and his out his reach in terms of the coaches that he's influenced and, and dealt with in his coaching career. He's definitely going to want D'Amico Ryan's to be one of those guys if he truly believes that he can be a head coach here sooner rather than later. I would say the next guy on the list for me though wouldn't be Dan Quinn. It would probably be Gus Bradley just because of his familiarity with the system, the the four three wide nine, establishing it in Seattle, um, kind of the one that brought up and brought Sala up underneath it. Uh, going back to the guy who masterminded it would be the next best option, I believe. Uh, and I would not put Dan Quinn, I don't think even in my top three, you guys know how I feel about Dan Quinn. Yeah. Not a big Dan Quinn fan is what it is. If he does end up in San Francisco, it's probably not the worst thing in the world, but wouldn't be my first choice. What about his daughter, Harley? It's definitely not his daughter. Uh, one thing I know for sure is that uh, Kyle Shanahan will hire the best defensive coordinator that he can find. He's done outstanding hiring coaches, so if he does decide to go with D'Amico Ryans, then he knew that D'Amico Ryans was the guy to go with. And these other guys, you know, they, they do give good options, but being able to keep the same terminology and the same scheme, still running Chris Kacarek wide nine, 
is exactly what the 49ers need to do. That's how they built the team. So just the continuity that they would keep by, you know, making that D'Amico Ryans and just elevating him to, you know, the defensive coordinator job would be a good thing to do. But I think Dan Quinn would be the next best option. I agree with you, Horst. And I think that um, I don't really care what happened in Atlanta as a head coach. He's not a head coach now. There's lots of guys who have been fired as head coaches and are still really great coordinators. And so uh, I'm only going to judge him on the coordinator position and not the head coach position. If he was going to be a head coach, then I would judge him on that. But Kyle Shanahan knows who's the king head honcho in the in the locker room, and he'll take care of business. Plus, I think Dan Quinn's actually a really good guy. But I think D'Amico Ryans would be the best choice, too, because you have Fred Warner, and that's his position coach. And you want to make sure this guy stays and is happy, and I think this would, might make him very happy. Um, did Wade Phillips and Mike Shanahan ever work together? No, I don't believe there's any Shanahan so Wade Phillips connection. Also, because we, you know what? We do know who is the head honcho there. It's Papa Shanahan. It isn't Kyle. <laughs> also, was Kyle the offensive coordinator in Houston when Wade Phillips was the defense coordinator? Ooh, wee. That is a spicy meet the ball. I don't believe so. I don't think any Shanahans have ever coached with him. I don't believe so. But I'm just curious. Because if that's true, if we're wrong about that, then that would put Phillips in the group. I don't believe they have any connections at all in the NFL. But I don't see that. Other than they both coach in the NFL, it's probably about it. Well, I hope so. Wade Phillips is 73. He's coached with almost everybody. He is he's That's ancient. Why I that <laughs> he is ancient. That is accurate. Him and Shanahan's dad are probably near the same age. Yeah. Well, by the way, Papa Shanahan, he's got a nice little gray going on. Yep. It's not even a little bit of I'm gray. I'm starting to think he was really dying his hair when he was still coaching in There's Washington. a good chance. No way. There's a really good chance that he was using just for men. Just for men. Not a sponsor of this podcast. That's right. Which it could be. Could be. Horst, you do have some update on something something very spicy and interesting. What did you got? So the 49ers have signed 15 players. off. 12 of them are off their practice squad. And three were off other teams to reserve futures contracts. Basically means they'll get to at least mini camp with the team. If not, usually to training camp at least. They are as follows. Cornerback Adonis Alexander. Ooh, that's a name. Defensive lineman Josiah Coatney. Oh, yeah. Safety Chris Edwards. Mm-hmm. Linebacker Jonas Griffith. That should ring a bell. A lot of people were high on him in Niners camp. Defensive lineman Deshaun Hall. Cornerback Tim Harris Jr. Who was a sixth-round pick of the Niners just two years ago. Um, fullback Josh Hokett. Rece- wide receiver Joan Jennings, who was also a pick of the Niners last year. Safety Obi Melifonwu, who was a second round pick of the Raiders in 2017. Oh my. Wide receiver Austin Prohl, the son of Ricky. Offensive lineman Dakota Shepley. Receiver Kevin White, who was on the team in spurts this year. Offensive lineman Isaiah Williams. Tight end Chase Harrell. And safety, Jared Maiden, who is another undrafted guy that drew big reviews in Niners camp this year. So, guys, um, out of that list, who's one, maybe two guys that you're interested in or excited about? Alex? I think the, the one that stands out to me in my mind most off is Juwan Jennings. Um, the receiver position for the Niners has been in flux consistently. Um, really getting to, a chance to see what he potentially could be or could do for the 49ers would be huge. Um, they drafted him this last year. Things happen. 2020 was what it was. It is what it is. Hoping 2021 can be a better start for him, and hopefully we get to see a little, a little Juwan Jennings in the offense in the system with a healthy Garoppolo or with whoever it is that ends up playing quarterback for the Niners down here, down the road in the future. He's the one that stands out the most in my mind because depth at the wide receiver, wide receiver position for the 49ers right now definitely doesn't hurt. Yeah, he, he was one that Kyle Shanahan mentioned that if he wouldn't have got hurt, the hamstring injury that he suffered was just so bad that it actually pulled away from the bone. He wasn't able to make his way back. So he he's going to be somebody that can come into training camp and really do damage. He dropped too many footballs last year in training camp, and that's the reason he did not make the roster. But I think he could be a replacement for some of the guys we're missing. He's a big physical receiver that could have success 
in the red zone. And if we're having to replace, you know, different people that are on the roster, he might be one to do it. Um, there's a couple other guys. I think Jared Maiden, just because of his skills, he played at Alabama. He's kind of a, he can play in the slot as a, you know, corner, or he can play safety, which is really where he's home. But he's a, he's a good player and he's good in coverage. And then, you know, just to see what they do with kind of these guys, uh, the guy from the Raiders that used to play the Raiders. Noah Fong. Yeah, and he played Fong. with uh, New England as well. He's a big physical guy. He's a 4'4 guy, he's six foot three. You know, he's 230 pounds. And he's a guy that you don't know if he translates to an in-the-box safety, which I think is what he's actually made for. I watched some video on him just to get familiar. Um, he looks kind of the Cam Chancellor build without that contact. He does not bring that contact. But I also thought to myself, with the way the 49ers play defense, could he possibly translate to linebacker? So he's someone I'm going to keep an eye on just to see one of those guys' second round talent. You never know what can happen if he gets into the right system with the right coaches. Speaking of big talent and not knowing what can happen, they must have liked something they saw in Kevin White to bring him back around. Yep. Um, he didn't produce much. He hasn't produced much in his career. But he's a big time talent, and he did do one thing this year that he never has, and that's stay healthy. Yeah, through a whole year, through camp, through. So um, I'm excited to see him back. Um, the guys you mentioned, both Maiden, Jennings, Obi, Melifonu, are all guys that have been big prospects at one point. Then two other guys I really like, uh, Jonas Griffith. Yep. Was is an athletic linebacker. He played small school. I think it was Indiana State. Yep. He was an undrafted guy. But he really fits this defense as in coverage. He's quick. He's athletic. He's supposed to be a hard hitter. Might be a good special teams back and linebacker. And then the other guy I still have faith that he might be a player is Tim Harris. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Harris was a six-round pick two years ago. He spent his entire first year injured. His second, So this last year was basically his rookie year. Um, he spent most of it on the practice squad. He did get in a couple games at the end, correct? Some light play he was time. activated, yeah. I think he got some special teams work. I don't know if he got any defensive snaps. But he's another. He fits this cover three mold in that he's a big, physical, long-armed guy with a lot of athleticism. So he's a guy. And once again, if they didn't think there was something there, they wouldn't be keeping him around. Right. He's another guy that just can't stay healthy. Yeah. I, know. I think with Jonas as well, I, I know we're all high. You know, we all liked him, you know, coming out and... He, you know, I mean, undrafted and then signed. Don't be surprised if you don't see a position change. Yeah. So what, safety? Uh, no. I, I think he could even translate to two positions, either defensive end or fullback. Oh, wow. I think both positions are kind of right up his alley. And I, I thought more he could look like a pass rusher. And if they work with him and skills, he's got the build. He's fast. And in college, he was known for blitzing and a lot of sacks. So he might be the kind of guy that could translate and move positions. Could happen. So you heard it here fo first, folks. Look out for Jonas Griffith. Jonas Griffith. I love He's him. been saying it since since camp. I have. I like him. He does. He likes him a lot. What about some of these front office potential departures? And some of these have us a little shaky. We don't like hearing some of it. Yeah. A couple of the names. Give me one that you're that you think is the most likely, and that you're the most, and the one that you're the most worried about. I think Adam Peters is the most likely because he's a guy that's kind of hot on everyone's, you know, radar. And Carolina brought him in for an interview. I really don't want to lose him. Um, there has been a push within the 49ers fan base for Peters to be named GM and John Lynch, you know, to be uh, president of player personnel. And I think that that wouldn't be such a bad move to not lose him because he has done a very good job of locating talent, helping the 49ers, you know, find the right guys. Um, he's not someone you want to lose in the front office. But if the 49ers don't make that decision and John Lynch, you know, is still the GM, I'll be OK with it. I just I hate losing guys from the front office because I think they've done a, just a fantastic job. Um, but what this does show is how good the 49ers front office is, is very evident to every team in the league. And they're going to start picking these guys off. And hopefully we don't lose him or Martin Mayhew. Yeah, um, Adam Peters is, he pretty much was the architect of the Broncos Super Bowl team that won the Super Bowl despite Peyton Manning. Um he built that defense. He built them from the ground up defense first after they got smoked in that Super Bowl by Seattle. 
pretty him and Lynch pretty much did the same thing with the Niners. Built them defense inside out first. And um so that's I mean two very good teams he, he's put together. Um so yeah, that's a guy I do not want to lose. Martin Mayhew, I'm going to be honest, I don't know as much about. I know he's a name that Shanahan and Lynch always bring up and give credit to doing things well. So I'm assuming, and now that other teams want to interview him, I'm going to go ahead and assume that he's an integral part of the team as well. Um, I Like you said, I don't want to lose these guys because they've done such a great job of spotting late round to undrafted talent and for the coaches to develop. Yeah, and, and the big thing too, the... the the hard part is with front office departures, it's not like coaching departures where there's a bunch of coaches or up and coming coaches out there that you can just go pick out of a group and be like, this guy has shown a lot of potential, this offense has done this and this offense has done that. A lot of teams don't hit in drafts. They don't. They, they, I mean, that's just the, the reality of the situations. You don't see a lot of teams every year, 32 teams in the NFL are not hitting on the, all their draft picks. You have teams that are, haven't hit on draft picks in a decade. Um, so front office personnel in terms of player development, understanding, scouting, finding what it is that that, 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 that is that it factor in a player that puts them over the hump and what makes them that diamond in the rough, that's hard to do. When you got a guy like Peters who's done it not just in San Francisco but in another location, it makes him all that much more valuable because those guys, are, they're not a dime a dozen. Those are not easily replaceable cogs in the wheel. Those are complete restructuring of how the wheel functions and operates, how it turns, um, sort of changes. And so, yeah, the people calling on Lynch to, to take a promotion up to try and keep this guy here, I mean, yeah, you probably should definitely consider it. Peters is, is a very talented, talented individual and definitely is going to be being not only a GM, but probably a director of football operations at some point in a major role in a front office, somewhere down the line, I would hope we could find a way to get it done in San Francisco and keep him here long term. Um, but if we can't, he's definitely going to be a guy who over the next five, six years is going to be hopping around and taking promotion after promotion or being promoted within one organization to the tip top and being in charge of everything top down. Yeah, they have nine selections in the draft this year. You really would like to keep the continuity in the front office with the scouting and everything so that way they could take advantage, full advantage of having nine selections and replenish this roster. You've got the salary cap at an all-time low. It's probably going to be at 175, 175 million. And that is, you know, I believe that is... 24 is that 24 million less yes yeah it yeah was 20, right under 200 yeah it's 24 million less than it was this year so you've never seen the salary cap go down like this usually it goes up 15 to 20 million this time it's not and that is something huge they were built to be sustainable at a 20 million increase per year and now they have to decrease by over 20 million Wow, that's going to be fun to do, and that's why. Good luck, Kansas City. And yeah, <laughs> and that's why when we get into next week's podcast, we are going to be getting into who's staying, who's going, and which free agents the 49ers need to hold on to, who they can let go, and who they just have to let go. It's true because there are there are going to be a few names that you have to part with, right? And we're going to let you know who they are right here. On Tuesday, 5.30 Pacific, specific time. Specifically mm -hmm. at 5.30. It's correct. Right, it's accurate. It's but accurate. you can watch it anytime it's on YouTube. Also true. Or you can listen to it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Pods, or Sh wherever you listen to your podcast. Sure. You know we you may can even, do all three. Yeah, we may, we may even throw it on Facebook just for, for poops and giggles. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. It's a great idea. You make poops? Sometimes. Nice. All right, guys, I think you know what time it is. Let's chalk another one up. Okay. I want you to put a picture of me looking all sexy like this. <laughs>